had an affinity to Jews. And what I'm going to do is explain, you know, what, what evidence is there of that affinity and how did that affinity develop? Um, but I'm going to start with how I came to the subject in the first place, which is kind of interesting and maybe a little bit different. Um, actually, the truth is I was lying in bed one night. And uh, by the way, just let me say that I had just, uh, just published a book on Windsor Mountain School, which was a private progressive boarding school in Lenox. Uh, and I wrote the history of that school. It was an extraordinary story also. And I, and the book came out and I was pleased. I had spent four or five years on putting it together and it was published by the History Press. And you know, when, you, when you're doing research, you really have a lot of fun gathering information. The writing is not that much fun, but the, the research is always fun. So when, I, when that book came out and I had no more research to do, I said, I've got to find another topic to write about because I love doing research. So anyway, with that in mind, let's go back to my bed where I'm lying there and I can't fall asleep and I don't know why I can't fall asleep, but um, you know what happens when you're a little restless, you start, your mind starts to wander a bit. And um, so I started thinking about Elvis and vintage clothing. Now, why did I think of that? Well, I do collect vintage clothing. I am, um, I love 1940s dresses and I love the general 1940s, 1950s clothing, and I, I just find them rather wonderful, better than what is now out there in the fashion world. So anyway, I'm thinking about vintage clothing and how Elvis used to look really sharp in some of his plaid jackets. I think I, I, think I have a picture maybe here. You know, this is um, a picture of Elvis in, in his plaid jacket, and he wore something like that. Uh, when he went on the Ed Sullivan show and the Milton Berle show. And I don't know why I thought of that, but there he was in my head. And I said, um, hmm, I wonder who Elvis's uh, tailor was. So I don't know. Again, my mind is wandering. I took my phone from the side of the bed and I Googled. I said, Elvis Presley's tailor. And up came Bernard Lansky. And that, that I said, a Jewish tailor. Well, so he had a Jewish tailor. I guess that's not a big deal because a lot of people have Jewish tailors. But I thought, well, let me find out who this Bernard Lansky is. So I googled Bernard Lansky. And that's when I discovered that he wasn't just Elvis's tailor. He was Elvis's friend. They had a 25 plus year friendship. The fact is that Elvis had so much respect for Bernard and Bernard came to love Elvis. If we have time, I'll tell you the story of how they connected in the first place, but the relationship was extraordinary. And I thought, he, he really loved this man. A Jewish man was, was a friend of Elvis's. So that, that was amazing to me. And of course, what's the next question you ask? Does he have any more Jewish friends? And that was the beginning, folks. I began the next day to, start, to find out if, if Elvis Presley had any other <laughs> associations with Jews. And the, the onion, I started to peel the onion. It was amazing. What I started to find was not only did he have friends among the merchants of Memphis, uh, Jewish merchants of Memphis, but that within his own group, the Memphis Mafia, they called themselves, his inner circle, he had, half of them were Jewish. And then, I found out that there was the possibility that he himself had Jewish roots. This, it was really amazing what started to turn up. And I began to, in earnest, uh, do the research on Elvis and Jews. Of course, I Googled Elvis and Jews and that was my beginning. But you know, there were, there were other clues as to the fact that this was a good thing for me to do because it was meant to be. Because what happened was one of the things I found out early on was that Elvis's great grandmother or grandmother on his father's side, that's not the Jewish side, on his father's side, uh, her name was Rosella. And I thought that's, that's a, you know, an indication that this is the kind of research I should be doing. There's not too many people who have anything like my name, uh, except for that one letter at the end, uh, her name was just like mine. So I began the research and I, couldn't stop. It was just an, an amazing uh, amount of information that I never thought possible. So 
that's how I came to write the book. And I has, as, as I said, I had been looking for another topic. So that was just a really wonderful gift. And so I began to, I began that first chapter, you know, really looking at, I had heard that there was a possibility he had some Jewish roots. It seemed incredible to me, but I, I went right to the book that came up on Google <laughs> um, by Elaine Dundee is her name. Uh, she's she's uh, the late Elaine Dundee. And she wrote a book called Gladys and Elvis. And I had heard and seen that that, that might have some, you know, that she supposedly found out that he had Jewish roots. So I thought, wow, so let, let me read that book. And I immediately read that first chapter and I read the whole book. And the first chapter, however, is where she reveals her research. She went down to Tupelo where he was born. She went to Memphis where he grew up. Um, and she found some evidence from, from a relative. Uh, she found out the name of Nancy Burdine, first of all. Nancy Burdine apparently was the name of Elvis's Jewish great-great-grandmother who'd come from, her family had come from Lithuania. She had been born um, here, in, I mean, in, in, uh, in the South, uh, but apparently the family had come from Lithuania and she married uh, a, a man named Abner Tackett. Now, Elaine Dundee was able to find a man named Oscar Tackett, who she interviewed. He was a descendant of Abner's. And he said, oh yeah, my, my uh, relative um, Abner married a full-blooded Jewish woman. That's how, that's the quote. Um, so Elaine Dundee took it from him that this was the case. And, but that wasn't enough for me. And she then, she said things like, I went to the, re the um, you know, the courthouse and the records and the deeds and all this kind of thing to find out, you know, if, it, if in fact Oscar Tackett was correct about his, his uh, I don't know whether it was his uncle or what, um, who, marrying a Jewish woman. But, you know, as an historian, it's not enough to have a woman write uh, that Elvis Presley had a little bit of Jew Jewish in him. He had a little bit of Cherokee, a little bit of uh, Scots-Irish, a little bit of German. Okay, you know, I need some documentation as an historian. And there was nothing in her book that showed me that in fact he had Jewish roots. It was all sort of based on this Oscar Tackett and maybe I don't, she, she didn't even show the documents that she found. So it was hard to really say that this information was reliable. And so when I wrote the first, started to write the first chapter, I said, you know, I make it hypothetical. If this is true, if, if, if. And, um, and that was the way I wrote it until 2018. This was a real indication. And I'll tell you what happened in 2018. Apparently, there was a gravestone, and I had seen this gravestone on, on the uh, tube, and, and you know, I've seen it all over the internet and stuff, uh, but I didn't know much about how the Jewish star got onto Gladys's gravestone. But I did some research of my own, and I found out that Elvis, um, his mother died, by the way, Gladys died in 1958. In 1964, Elvis uh, went to the graveyard, and he, he always visited his mother's gravestone, but on this particular day in 1964, he brought two of his Jewish friends, Larry Geller and Marty Lacker. And he stood looking at the gravestone and with his friends as he had done many times before, and he looked at it and he said, you know, I think I want to put a Jewish star on my mother's gravestone. And Marty, uh, who followed every order that Elvis ever gave and or understood what orders meant, he went out immediately and made that happen. So a Jewish star was placed up, uh, across, opposite the cross that was on his mother's gravestone. And that's where that gravestone stayed until 1977, Elvis Presley dies and his, he's buried next to his mother. And his father, Vernon, uh, soon after the burial and so on, he hears and, and senses that, that there's, there's some grave robbing possibilities and he didn't want to take a chance that there would be 
uh, grave robbing and, and uh, some harm done to his son's gravestone and his wife's. So Vernon ordered that those gravestones, Gladys's and Elvis's, would be taken out and it would go to Graceland. But when it got to Graceland, what was established were these big slabs, these kind of uh, bronze slabs uh, indicating you know, Elvis and Gladys, and then of course uh, the uh, grandmother and so on. Um, and, and it's in the meditation garden. And I saw these slabs when I went down to Memphis um, in 2016 with my husband to do some research, obviously. And there was that th those were considered the the, uh, the gravestones. There it was. There were bronze plaques uh, flat on the ground and flowers and everything. Um, there was nothing like a gravestone with a Jewish star and a cross. That particular gravestone just disappeared. No one saw it after 1977. It's like it didn't exist. Now we're going to go to 2018. And um, it's the 60th anniversary of Gladys's death. And a woman named Angie Marchese, who's the archivist at Graceland, she went into this warehouse where there's got a, there's something like a million, <laughs> a million artifacts related to Elvis's life. And she finds this gravestone with the Jewish star. And she decides it should come out, it should be fixed up again and restored, and it should go in the meditation garden. And that's what happened. It was the first time that that gravestone was seen since 1977. Now, I'm writing that chapter, right? No more hypothesis that maybe he had Jewish roots, uh, Nancy Burdine was his great great grandmother. No, I was able to state it. Why? Because if Elvis Presley Enterprises, which governs all things Elvis, which governs Graceland, if they are putting that gravestone in the meditation garden for every tourist to see, then I can emphatically say he had Jewish roots. And there's another indication that he had Jewish roots. And by the way, before I give you the other indication, let me just show you the, the gravestone. I, I hope you can see the Jewish star. Um, and it doesn't much matter, you know, what the words are, but the point is there is an, a star of David on Gladys Presley's gravestone. Now, how, how could that be? Well, let's, let's, the other indication is the following. I talked to I became friends with two of Elvis's inner circle. It's, it's quite a miracle and I, it's a long story, but I became a good friend of Larry Geller's and I'm still in touch with him. Marty Lacker died uh, over a year ago, but Marty and I were uh, exchanged a lot of emails at which time he, he told me, uh, shared a lot of information. And one of the things that both of them told me was that when uh, the Elvis told them the following story, Elvis apparently told them that when he was young, uh, I'm not sure what age, maybe 10, 11, 12, that his mother sat him down and said, Elvis, we have Jewish blood, but don't tell anybody because people do not like Jews. Actually, one of those people was his father, Vernon, who was a virulent anti-Semite. And there's a lot of information in the book about the nature of that anti-Semitism. It wasn't pretty. Um, so here is here are members of his inner circle saying, testifying that Elvis himself told them what his mother said. So, you know, as far as I was concerned at that point, chapter one was going to conclusively say that he had Jewish roots. Now, he never obviously practiced Judaism. He never, he was a, a, a member, as I told you, of the Assembly of God Church. And he went religiously as a kid. Uh, he sang in the choir. He sang uh, a lot of their music and, um, and, and was a church going Christian. But, um, but he is a Jew. I, know, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly. As a Jew, I should know how to pronounce it. Halakhically, halak, halakha or halakha is Jewish law. Elvis is a Jew according to Jewish law because he's a descendant from a matrilineal line 
unbroken line of women. And that's, that's what Jewish law states, that if you are an, in an unbroken line of Jewish women, again, Nancy Burdine being the first, on down to Gladys, then you are considered a Jew. You don't have to practice the religion. You don't have to uh, you know, identify as a Jew. You are considered a Jew if that is the nature of things. So Elvis knew this and Elvis's mother knew this and she told him he had Jewish blood. So that, I put that particular issue to rest and I was really, uh, really amazed at the information that, that came across. And you know, now a lot of people, you know, ever since the book came out over a year ago, there have been people writing articles about this and it, I don't, I'm not gonna say they're taking it all from my book, but it, it sounds like from what I've read, I've read a few articles by people, it, it, sound, it seems that it was sort of lifted from, from my first chapter, which is just fine, you know, spread the word that he had Jewish roots, which is fine with me. But um, it hadn't really come out in, in a published form. Um, there was always the, sort of this rumor and the rumor about the Star of David, but nobody understood why and, and so on. So I was happy to be able to write a chapter that revealed um, all of the all of the details of that situation. Um, he was proud of that. And it's interesting, um, Larry became very close, Larry Geller. Larry met uh, Elvis, it's a long story, but in a nutshell, he met him when he became his hairdresser out in Hollywood when Elvis was making films. And he, he had these conversations with Larry um, in a way that revealed to Larry that that Elvis was searching. He was, he was searching for answers uh, to such questions as, for example, um, why am I Elvis? Why, why did I, why was I given this gift to be this, this huge star? That was one of his questions. Another one of his questions was, why did I survive when my twin died at birth? Elvis had a brother, Jesse Guerin, and and he died at birth and Elvis never got over it. He couldn't understand why me, why was I, did I have a greater, do I have a greater purpose? Is that why I survived? So these, he was on a search for answers. Nobody thinks of Elvis as a, full, you know, a philosophical searcher, someone who is interested in, in other religions and in answering big, deep questions, but Elvis was, and Larry recognized this and so Larry, who himself was um, a very much a practicing Jew, also a vegetarian, also a man who uh, read all kinds of philosophies, Eastern and Western. And he shared with Elvis all of these different books that he thought would help Elvis to understand some of these questions or to answer some of these questions. And the other thing that Larry did was um, share with Elvis a lot about Judaism, the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. And that, that really struck me that, you know, the idea of Elvis Presley studying the Kabbalah, but he was fascinated by it. And he was particularly interested in the part uh, of the section called the Gematria, which is a sort of an analysis of the numbers and letters and how certain things become symbols. So that's where he learned about the Chai, the Chai being, uh, meaning life, the Jewish Hebrew letter. And and he, he loved the learning about that. And he loved that idea of, of high meaning long life. So he went and he purchased a beautiful gold with diamond encrusted high and he wore it. And, and there are pictures, uh, there's a picture in the book but there's <clears throat> also pictures online of Elvis Presley wearing a high sometimes with uh, a cross and sometimes with just the high and a star or a star of David. Um, he was also fascinated by, as I say, Gematria, and, and um, Larry shared with him the meaning of his name, of Elvis's name, El, Elohim, God, and, um, and, and this, V-I-S, power, power, the power of God. He couldn't believe that his name, Elvis, meant the power of God, and and there's many examples in the book of what Larry was able to share with him that he was so fascinated by. And he gave him, uh, he, said, he said Elvis would write in the, 
in the margins of, of the Kabbalah, of the books that he gave him. Um, and and he, in, in uh, Larry's book, he actually has a photograph of one of the pages from one of the books that he gave him where Elvis's own handwriting is, is asking some questions uh, in reference to what was written there. So he learned about the Kabbalah, he, he wore it ha -hai. He He also um, had the following watch made. He went to his friend, um, he had this wonderful um, jeweler, Harry Levitch. Harry Levitch was a jeweler in Memphis. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting when, when you think of, I'll tell you about Harry in a second, but first let me tell you about the watch. So, so Elvis, uh, Marty Lacker designed a watch that had a flashing cross and star of David. So it back and forth, back and forth. And, and so Elvis decided to have a hundred of these made so he could give them out to all of his friends. And for him, it meant kind of a, a sign of brotherhood, the cross, the star of David. And, and I have a, a photograph of the, of the watch in the book. And it was, a, a, again, a sign that, that Elvis really um, believed in brotherhood and believed in, uh, and very generous <laughs> to have a hundred watches made. But he had, why did he have this um, sort of affinity to Harry Levitch? I mean, there were a lot of jewelers in Memphis. So why Harry? Well, the re there was a reason for that. When, when Elvis was young and he was in high school, they, they were poor. Um, they, they had no money. And, you know, sometimes not even decent shoes. Elvis found out <clears throat> a few years after high school that Harry Levitch had put together a fund, the shoe fund for high school students who couldn't afford decent shoes. And, there's, and so the principal made sure that, that shoes would be purchased for any of the students who were in need. It's quite likely that Elvis himself benefited from that fund. He knows for, Elvis knows for sure that two of his friends benefited from that fund. Harry Levitch was a generous, wonderful man. And I quote him in the book, um, he loved Elvis. He and his wife loved Elvis like a son. So here's an example so far. I mean, I didn't get into the story yet of, of uh, Bernard Lansky, but Ber let me, suffice it to say that Bernard treated Elvis with respect at a time when he had pimples, greasy hair, shabby clothes. He treated him with respect. And I think, you know, in talking to you, as I said, I would try to identify why did he have this affinity to Jews? One of the reasons is, is quite obvious, and that is that there were Jewish merchants. There were more than just uh, Bernard and Harry Levitch. There were other Jewish merchants who were very kind to, to Elvis, treated him with respect, and, and um, Elvis never forgot it. He never forgot that the people, that the people who were kind to him, and there's another example of who was kind to him when he was young. The Jewish Community Center of Memphis gave poor Elvis a membership every year to the Jewish Community Center so he could go, he couldn't afford it of course, but they wanted him to have this scholarship or this, this free membership. And he would, that's where he learned how to play racquetball. You probably don't know that he was an excellent racquetball player and, um, and that he was an excellent horseman and so on. I mean, there's, he's, he was quite athletic, which that came as a surprise to me. Um, you know, you, you have this image of this sort of hair slicked back and, you know, don't want to get my clothes dirty kind of thing. No, this guy was out there. He could play football. He could do anything. He was an athlete. He, he got a black belt in karate, quite an accomplished athlete. But, um, but in terms of the, of the racquetball and so on, um, and the, he learned all of, about racquetball at the Jewish Community Center. And when he became wealthy, he gave the Jewish Community Center donations every year. And one year, if this is true, I mean, it, I got this from several sources. One year, he gave them a check for $150,000. Um, he particularly wanted, um, he wanted to pay for the establishment of two music rooms. And he wanted them to be in memory of the parents of um, a gentleman named Fortis, Alan Fortis. Alan Fortis's parents 
is they are the people that he put the, in, in memory of his parents because Alan Fortas's parents were very, very nice to, to Elvis, but Alan Fortas was a part of the Memphis Mafia. Now, those of us who are older, we know the name Fortas. The judge who had some problems and issues and didn't, didn't quite get to stay on the court, but well respected for a lot of reasons, for a lot of other reasons. The Fortis family was an established Jewish family in Memphis. And one of Al, uh, Elvis's best friends was Alan Fortis, the nephew of Judge A. Fortis. Um, so he not only gave to, you know, the Jewish uh, sources who were kind to him and good to him, um, he gave to all kinds of, uh, of uh, charities, African-American charities, as well as um, St. Jude's. He was very famous for giving huge amounts to St. Jude's. He loved children. He gave a lot of money to support children. And he built a youth center for African-American children in Tupelo, where he was born. He lived with black people. You know, this idea that, you know, that Elvis was at all prejudiced. I mean, I don't know where that came from, but he loved black people. He loved Jewish people. It's just, and he loved, of course, as you know, he loved black music because so much of what he sings is taken from a, a lot of the music. He, he absorbed a lot of influences, rhythm and blues, country music, um, gospel. He put all of this together and, and, and did it his way and came out with his own sound. But he listened to African American stations, uh, radio stations. He loved. If you go online, you can find Elvis Presley in a photograph with almost every well-known black singer uh, in his day and age. He loved them, and they loved him. So uh, it, it, it's just remarkable how unprejudiced he was. But interestingly, I, I just mentioned something. He was stunned at the prejudice that existed against Jews. He didn't understand it. He, um, he said to Larry Geller uh, one time, he said, you know, Larry, I would go to my church and I, you know, and I'd be sitting there and we'd be praying and, and all of these names of people came up like Ezekiel and Moses and Abraham and Isaac, they're all Jews. And everybody's talking about Jews in my church. And then these people, they walk out of the church and then they say, those goddamn Jews he didn't understand that, that hypocrisy. In the church, they're all, you know, adoring. And out, they were anti-Semitic, many of them. And it made no sense to him. He had the, the mind to see that, to see the, to see the uh, contradiction. Another uh, thing that Larry shared with me was Elvis's awareness of all of the, well, Elvis felt like Jews had made a huge contribution to the world. And he started out talking about Jesus. He knew, you know, you know, I actually had students who didn't know Jesus was a Jew. Uh, it, and it's rather startling. And we, we could have an interesting conversation about that kind of ignorance, but it exists. Elvis knew that Jesus was a Jew. And Elvis also talked about Einstein and Freud and others who he felt really did good for the world, made real contributions. And he didn't understand how something like the Holocaust could happen. In fact, one time uh, he and Larry were in a hotel room uh, watching television and a, a film about the Holocaust was on. And, and Larry said Elvis started to cry. Elvis started to get angry. Elvis started to say, those goddamn Nazis. Uh, and he was physically uh, and emotionally upset. And you know, it's interesting, another time he got very upset. Most of you know that Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. And when he was assassinated, Elvis was, uh, at the time, he was uh, making a movie uh, and he came back to his room and he was watching the funeral and, and, and a friend of his, uh, one of the actresses in the film uh, came into the room and they were both watching the funeral and she said, this act, I quote this actress uh, in the book, she said, you know, I sat there with Elvis and we're watching the, the funeral of Martin Luther King and Elvis starts to cry and he gets down on his knees and he starts to sing Amazing Grace. 
And she said it was the most emotional experience she'd ever had was watching this. And, she, and the reason Elvis, Elvis was, he, he loved Martin Luther King. He loved Robert Kennedy. He loved, you know, he, so, so he, he cried for a lot of reasons, but, but the, the connection that he had with these people, Martin Luther King meant something to him. Uh, he was a black man who, for whom he had a lot of respect. And he felt, I think, particularly upset because it happened in his city in Memphis, the city that he loved. Um, you know, Elvis loved living there and, and the fact that this tragedy happened in his beloved city was made it even worse. Um, so th that's an introduction to some of the people, but I, I, I don't want to stop talking till I introduce you to the rabbi. The rabbi upstairs, chapter two, the rabbi upstairs, Alfred Fruchter. This, this is the story. I mean, I, I still get the chills when I talk about this because Elvis lived in an area of um, Memphis called the Pinch. It was like the Lower East Side, uh, lots of immigrants, lots of poor people, a lot of mingling uh, of, of different nationalities. And um, so, and, and most of the time people would move in there when they didn't have their, the money and then they made the money and they moved out. You know, the de it was always like, can't wait to, you know, get out to Long Island or wherever you happen to go uh, after you make some money. I guess New Jersey is another place a lot of people went after they started to make money. Anyway, um, but let's get back down to the pinch. So, um, so Elvis, uh, when, he, when they were poor, uh, they moved into this duplex on Alabama Street and Elvis was, um, um, Elvis, the Presleys were on the first floor and Rabbi Alfred Fruchter and his family were on the second floor. The relationship was one of the most beautiful, one of the warmest that, that I, I have a whole chapter about it because it was so rich and so unusual. I won't say that Vernon, you know, was part of that, that relationship, but certainly Gladys made very good friends with Jeanette, the rabbi's wife. Uh, they loved the rabbi and the rabbi loved them. And they asked, um, Elvis, if he would become their Shabbos goy, we now say Shabbos helper. Um, I don't think that the, the former name is used much anymore. But anyway, he became their Shabbos helper and he would turn the lights on and do other kinds of things on the Sabbath. Uh, rabbi Fruchter was an Orthodox rabbi, so he, he had certain, um, you know, Orthodox uh, do not turn lights on and do other kinds of tasks um, on the Sabbath. So Elvis was happy to do it and Jeanette would often, she, in an interview that she had, she said to the interviewer, you know, I used to try to get Elvis to just take, take a little bit of, a, of you know, money. You know, I wanted to pay him for all the things that he did for us. And every time I offered it, he said, no, Mrs. Fruchter, I do this because I want to. I want to do it. I want to um, help you. And she said there was nothing she could do to get him to, to, um, to take the money. And she, she said she remembers when he graduated from high school, she got him a pair of uh, cufflinks, uh, onyx. And he just was beside himself with joy because he had never been able to afford anything like that. And she said he was so appreciative. They invited Gladys and Elvis to Sabbath dinner. And so Elvis had a yarmulke and he would wear it out of respect for, for them. He learned to love Jewish food. He loved simis. For those of you who don't know, that's a carrot dish, uh, which I, I think is just uh, delicious and, and probably not eaten except on certain holidays. Um, and he also got to love challah. And most of you know that Elvis Presley's favorite sandwich was peanut butter and banana. And sometimes he'd add bacon, greasy bacon. He started to eat these sandwiches on challah. It was his favorite thing. He also, um, from what I have heard, I don't know, I can't testify to this for sure, but I think that I was told that he actually purchased a mezuzah, which is the, a little, um, usually silver or something, which has a Jewish prayer in it. And you put it on the doorpost and uh, for good luck. And, and um, as you exit the house, uh, you kiss it. And I was told that he had, when he lived out in Hollywood, that he had 
one of the uh, mezuzah on, the, on his doorpost and he, and he would uh, kiss it on the way out. Um, but we do know that the fructors educated him about the Jewish religion. He learned a lot from them uh, besides the Sabbath and, and how it's celebrated and the foods that, that they eat. He also learned about the music because the rabbi would very often uh, play cantorial music on his record player and the windows would be open. And Elvis, there is one of the authors that I read said that he is sure that Elvis was influenced by the cantorial music uh, that he heard. Um, and in some way it influenced the way he sang. I myself think that if there's any kind of influence from, you know, in, in his music, that it really came from his, the Jewish songwriters. You know, um, that's a whole chapter in the book, which I won't go into other than to say that, um, that there's a fellow, um, Alan, I can't remember his last name, but he, he decided he wanted to see who were the most, um, uh, the greatest of Elvis's songwriters, who had written, that's right, who had written the most successful songs that were like number one for a hundred weeks on the billboard. Uh, so, so he did this kind of thing where he determined how many records were sold of a particular song, etc. He then wrote up the uh, list of Elvis's 10 most successful best um, songwriters, that is, who, whose records sold the most. Uh, and it turned out that eight out of 10 of those songwriters were Jews. And I loved writing, I loved doing the research on the songwriters themselves it, it, because all of them have interesting stories and also the relationship that they had with Elvis and so on. Uh, it, it, it's really very heartwarming. But let me just go back for a minute to the rabbi. Um, Elvis's first hit record, not nationally, but locally, and then it became national, was That's All Right, Mama. It's a great song. It was sung by an African-American blues uh, singer and, and Elvis loved it and he sang it. And it went wild. Uh, it was played in Memphis and people were calling up the radio station saying, play it again, play it again. It went viral. And so Elvis, um, you know, he wanted to hear the record and, uh, and he wanted to get the phone calls that were being made to him congratulating him. He didn't have a telephone, they were too poor. They didn't have a phonograph. So they would go upstairs to the rabbi's apartment and they would, they, or, or they borrowed the phonograph and they played the record over and over again on the rabbi's phonograph. And they had to go upstairs to the rabbis to get the telephone calls of congratulations from everybody who was calling. Um, and Elvis loved the children. I have a photograph, I, well, you'll see it in the book. There's a photograph of Elvis kneeling down, uh, sort of squatting down, so he will be the same height as two of the rabbi's children. The rabbi eventually had five children, but there's a photograph, a black and white photograph of Elvis with two of the rabbi's children. And the story goes that, uh, and by the way, when I say the story goes, who told the story? Jeanette told the story uh, over and over again to, to uh, people who interviewed her. And then when she died, when both of them had died, the children of the rabbi told the stories that they had heard from their parents. And now the grandchildren of the fructors are telling the stories. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I became a, a good friend of, of one of his children, one of the rabbi's children, um, Judy, Judy uh, is her name, Judy Minkoff Fructor, uh, Judy Fructor Minkoff. And uh, she was, she's just, she paid, well, you know, I'm, I'll be honest. When somebody compliments you who is close to the material, then it means so much. And she said to me, she called me up several times to say, I just have to tell you again, the way you portrayed my parents, uh, I, I couldn't have asked for anything more. It, it just, it, it's just a beautiful, beautiful um, commemoration of their relationship with Elvis and, and who they were. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm gonna just finish maybe by saying that I'd love, I'd love to tell you about the last time that, um, that Elvis saw the rabbi. By the time Elvis had done That's All Right Mama, 
he had really begun to you know, be on television and he got bigger and bigger and he could afford to move out of the pinch. And he bought the family's first house, not Graceland yet, but the, a, a beautiful home with a swimming pool and so on. <clears throat> and likewise, the rabbi moved out uh, and went and took a pulpit out in California, in San Francisco. It might have been Oakland, but anyway, it was out there. And um, the rabbi heard that Elvis was going to be doing a concert in uh, San Francisco, and he thought, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and say hi to my old friend Elvis." And um, and he went backstage with a note, with a little uh, letter, saying, "You know." wanting access to, to Elvis and identifying himself. And a fellow named George Klein took this note from another person who had gotten it from this guy, this rabbi. And George Klein opens the note and it's the rabbi's request to see Elvis and identifying the fact that he knew him in Memphis and so on. And George Klein, who was a friend in the Memphis mafia, a friend of his from high school, from high school, but he was now touring around with Elvis. He looks at this letter and he said, oh my God, this is Rabbi Fruchter. He was my bar mitzvah teacher. And so he said, of course, you know, he said to whoever, bring him in, bring him in. And they hugged and everything. And they had, he hadn't seen his rabbi in a long time. And he said, um, you know, he asked, he asked the rabbi, how do you know Elvis? And Elvis said, and, and uh, the rabbi said, well, we lived in the same duplex. Of course, come on. I'll, I'll bring you to Elvis. So when Elvis sees the rabbi, they embrace and they, they're so happy to see each other. And Elvis says to Rabbi Fruchter, you know, I have to go into this other room now to talk to the press before I give the concert. Come on with me, come, come, and come with me to, the, to see the press. So Elvis brings him on stage with him and the press is sitting out there and Elvis looks out at the reporters and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet my rabbi. And that's, I think, one of the best lines I've ever heard. Uh, it, and he never called him um, by his name. He always said, Sir Rabbi. That's how he addressed him. Anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful story uh, about that relationship. And I could talk about this for hours. But I want to get to your questions because I love questions. Oh, thank you so much uh, for, for this wonder, wonderful story. And we will give people a chance to, in a minute, I'm going to change the view so I can see if anybody's raising their hands or putting something in chat. But I think what's really amazing is um, in a broader sense, the look you've given us into Elvis's soul as a human being um, that, um, uh, you know, as reflected in the topics that you covered in the book. So um, would anybody like to ask a question? I've got the view open. Uh, you can raise your hand or put something in the chat. Um, okay, I see John Gallucci. Uh, let me unmute you. Hold on. Uh, let me uh, hold on. Uh, wait a second. Why am I not able to do this? Okay, you're unmuted. Um, I was actually going to say exactly the same thing. The first time that I went to Graceland was a year was years ago, and they used to have actual docents that brought people through the house. Now it's a tape recorder. It's not the same. Yeah, right. And the doses would, would tell these incredible stories about his generosity and um, just like a humble man he was. And you really, really, really captured that. And I've never heard, I've never heard any story about the, about the rabbi, but I do remember <laughs> when I saw the gravestone, they said that, that, that the Jewish star was there because he was such an inclusive person and he wanted everybody in his life. That was what the dose said um but that's really neat that you actually have stuff to back it up <laughs> yeah it's an amazing amazing phenomenon yeah it's true thank you my pleasure my pleasure thank you would uh would would anybody else like to like to add a question I'm having trouble meeting you now i love questions please 
I, I have one if no one else has one at the moment. Um, let me see. I don't see anybody putting anything in. Um, oh, there's somebody who has their hand raised. Lillian. Oh, yes, L yeah. Lillian. Okay. I gotcha. wrote this in the chat. A few years ago, I went on a Jewish heritage tour of Memphis showing all the Jewish people and the synagogues in Memphis. Unbelievable. When I tell people, they think there were no Jewish people. I think there were eight or nine synagogues. The Reform Synagogue was enormous. It had its own, uh, um, its own cemetery, its own park. The history of the Jews and many of the Jews in Memphis that I met had been living there four or five generations. And I also met the gentleman who owned, who claimed he or his family owned the majority of land. They were the largest landowner in the state of Tennessee. He had an amazing museum uh, of Chinese art that he collected and one room dedicated to the Holocaust. So this was a museum of Chinese art and the Holocaust. Oh. And, well, he, he's, he's in the book. He's in the book, yes. that gentleman. Okay. And, he, and there's a reference to his museum. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. He was in his 90s and spoke to, came to, to talk to our tour. Uh, seemed very fit, walked with a cane, but he was very fit. And we got to see Lansky's store and the Peabody Hotel with the ducks. But <laughs> yeah, I love that. The Jewish people in Memphis, and they spoke about that neighborhood where many of them came from, but now we're doing much better in life. And right. there's a Chabad there. And uh, also on Beale Street, I saw very fundamentalist Christian missionaries working too. So it's an, it's an amazing city. Um, I, I'm not from the, the South at all. And, and, I, it was, and I think that the history of the Jews in Memphis is amazing altogether. I, wanted, I think, I think your, your, your comments are so, so appreciated. I wanted you to know, I mean, first of all, you, you have given me the opportunity to tell you that there's a whole chapter on the Jew Jewish Memphis, in other words, a brief history of Jewish Memphis, because I was stunned when I found yeah. out that the largest yeah. Orthodox congregation in the country is in Memphis. Who yeah. would believe that? It is just mind boggling. And that you should see the synagogue. Oh my God. It is I, I had dinner, we had Friday night in the synagogue. They did their, I was there when they had their confirmation class and they had to do it in on Zoom, but before the, the pandemic, because they draw students from the various surrounding areas. You know, it's, it's, they yeah. serve a big bigger section than just Memphis. And they had students from a couple states, whatever borders around that area. Uh, unbelievable. And that synagogue uh, <laughs> is bigger, people know where we live. Two it's bigger than something. synagogues yeah. in Cherry Hill. The synagogue <laughs> in Memphis bigger than Cherry Hill. And they had their own full-time archivist, the synagogue. Can you believe it? it was, it's, it blew my mind. <laughs> it blew my mind too. I, I did not actually visit it in person, but there's a photograph of the synagogue uh, or the former place that they had in the book. But, but the fact that that size of the congregation is so big, over a thousand people can be accommodated in their, in their seating. And also that they are very busy um, pulling people in. I mean, there's a, there's a real concentrated effort to attract young Jewish couples to Memphis now. But I wanted to just mention or go back to what you said about the, the longevity of uh, or how far back Jews go in Memphis. The fact is that they were there in the Civil War and before, and, and, and some of them, I should add, um, were not always the liberal stereotype that we think. There were racists among them. There were slaveholders among them. They were no different in, in many cases than some of the Southerners uh, that they lived with uh, or next to. On the other hand, many of them were, of course, uh, very, very liberal. But what, what I found particularly interesting was that, that uh, there was a time it, that Abraham, well, that Grant, I, it's a long story, but, but there was a, a very prejudicial um, law passed in which uh, Jews were, were denied the right to trade and so on. Um, and, but, but the Christians weren't being punished for whatever the particular thing was. And, and uh, Lincoln came in and said, this is not right. 
uh, if, if you're going to be a cotton trader, Jew or non-Jew, you have to be treated equally. And only the Jews were being denied the right to trade. Uh, I don't remember all the details, but it's in the book. And, uh, and the Jews repaid him with thanks. They went to the uh, White House. I mean, they visited him. They thanked him profusely for treating them with that, respect. I, it's I, think, I thought that was from the uh, Kentucky area. Um, it was the Civil the War where Grant issued the thing that uh, stopped Jewish merchants. Um, and, and I will say the Jews of the time referred to Abraham Lincoln as Father Abraham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they did. Good mm -hmm. man. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating story. And I, I, I definitely wanted to include that in the, in the uh, book, A History of the Jews in Memphis, because it was so fascinating. And also in that chapter is the connection that Elvis had to some of the businessmen and some of the, of the, um, of the Jewish activities and so on, because there, there were many of those connections that he had with the, with the Jews. They say Memphis. that Lans Lansky gave him the first suit he wore for Ed Sullivan, that That's he didn't right. pay for that. Later on, he paid. <laughs> right, right, right. He gave, he, he, the, the saying goes, and this came from Hal Lansky, who I became a good friend of, and Hal Lansky also did the foreword for the book. Hal Lansky told me that his father was the first to extend credit to Elvis Presley. Okay, credit. <laughs> But, but and he picked the outfit, whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the Lanskys were the Taylor family that the, the Taylors that, that did a lot of his. Was it even after he became famous? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Hal, Hal Lansky told me a great story, and it's in the book as well. Uh, Hal said that when he, Hal, grew up uh, and, and became part of the business, um, which now has five stores, not one, but when he became part of the business, uh, his father would send him with a truckload of clothing out to Graceland because let's get, you know, because Elvis ordered up, you know, let's see what you got. And, uh, and, and then they always said, Hal said, there was never a time that he ever took any clothing back to the store. Elvis would keep it all. <laughs> <laughs> he loved clothes, loved clothes. And there's a lot about that in the book too. He was very savvy. And he loved the clothing that the, the African-American dudes you know, the, the, the cool guys on Beale Street, uh, the, music, the musicians and so on. He wanted to dress like them and, and eventually he did. Wow. Does anybody else have a question that they want to ask? Raise your hand or put in chat. Let me see. I, I, I was wondering if you could speak maybe a little bit more, had any more stories about um, Jewish influence or connection uh, to his music. You mentioned briefly um, that there was a significant statistic there, but. Right, well, the only, the, the main thing I would say uh, at this point uh, with some definitive, of the, you know, I, I can't, who knows exactly what, what the specific connection was, but I can tell you this, the fact that eight out of 10 of his top, top uh, composers, songwriters, were Jewish. And then I, I did biographies of each of them. I, I have biographical oh. sketches of each of them. And they were all aware, they were very much coming from families where Jewish music was present. So it's very likely that they, in the songs that they wrote for him, might have had some of that influence, uh, you know, come into, into the songs themselves. Um, because- You have a couple they, of examples on the top of your head? Oh yeah, Lieber and Stoller. <laughs> Lieber and Stoller, they, these two songwriters were amazing. Um, they, they wrote some of his top, uh, top songs. And oh, I, have, I, I forgot to mention that I knew one of these eight composers. Personally, I danced with him. The story <laughs> is amazing. His name was, was Schroeder. And, um, and, and his, he, Aaron Schroeder. Aaron Schroeder lived in Great Barrington with his wife. He's, he, she's still here, he died. But Aaron, when he was still alive, was part of our Jewish organization that we had. It, we had a, a Havarim, a, a Hevra, and we, we had a, a, some kind of dance. And I remember dancing with, with Aaron. And 
I, I knew that he was wealthy, but I, I didn't know how, you know, where the money came from. But uh, I remember asking somebody, I said, so where did the Schroeders make all the money that they have? Everybody talks about how rich they are. And somebody said to me, well, he supposedly wrote uh, the backside of one of Elvis's number one hits. I said, oh, that's cool. You know, he made, you know, even if it's the B side, you know, if it's it, so it was, it turned out it was the B side to Heartbreak Hotel. Okay, that's very good. So then fast forward, I'm writing this book, Aaron is dead. I'm interviewing Abby, his wife. She gives me a four hour interview and we're sitting there on her porch. And she said, what do you, what do you mean? You heard that he wrote the, the B side of Heartbreak Hotel. He wrote five number one hits for Elvis Presley, including It's Now or Never. I mean, really, and I could go into all the other. <laughs> and so, so Aaron uh, was interviewed. Um, oh, by the way, she said that Aaron loved Elvis. That Aaron would always. T she didn't know. It, it, she, Aaron came into Abby's life after the Elvis period for him, but she would tell him, tell her story, his wife's stories about how he would sit at the piano and play these songs, and El and Elvis would would sing them, and um, and they would work on them together to get it arranged just right. And one time. Elvis said to Aaron, I can't hit that note. Like, I don't know if you know that it's now or never, it goes up really high at the very end. And he apologized. He says, Aaron, I can't do it. I can't do it. And Aaron said, no, that sounded good. He said, no, it's not right. Elvis was such a genius. He knew when he, he nailed it and he wouldn't take anything less than nailing it. So he would go over and over. And so, so Aaron would talk about what a perfectionist he was and what a genius he was. And then, um, and then, Abby told me a story about how Aaron said that uh, he learned that Elvis's middle name was Aaron, Elvis Aaron Presley. And they thought, and, and, and Aaron Schroeder thought, wow, that's really exciting that we have the same middle name and they would talk about that. Um, it's, it's just incredible to know that I, you know, that, I, that I didn't know that for all these years and that Aaron was, was such a, an amazing songwriter and has written some of the greatest songs. So it was a lot of fun to know that. Anybody else have a question? John, is your hand? Oh, okay, here we go. I can't hear. I'm having trouble for some reason doing the unmute. Hold on. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, Where are in the, on? You mentioned the, um, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King. His 68 comeback special with the leather jacket and everything. There was a song at the end um, called If I Could Dream. I had to look it up because I couldn't remember the name. Yes. And it's all about peace and unity and it's a very move. I'm going to tell you that, I'm going to tell you that the, I wrote down the lines. It's a beautiful story. I, I should have, I mean, I could talk a half an hour about the comeback special. It was very, very mm -hmm. special. But here, Walter Earl Brown, African-American, he wrote this song uh, especially for Elvis, and it was all about brotherhood. And when El apparently during the rehearsal, when Elvis sang this for the first time uh, during the rehearsal, uh, people were watching him and they were looking at, he was so emotionally involved in this song that, that, that people were just like, oh my God, he's, he's just in another world. He was in another world when he sang it because he believed everything he was singing. And uh, so it says, if I can dream of a better land where all of my brothers walk hand in hand, tell me why, oh, why can't my dream come true? And ladies and gentlemen, I want to recommend something to all of you, and I hope you'll do this. There is an album called If I Can Dream. This song is on the album, along with some of his greatest hits, and it was put out posthumously by the London Philharmonic. What they did was they took his uh, 12 of his songs and they put, they put their orchestral, orchestral music behind him, backing him up. And it's the most stunning album because you're hearing Elvis authentically, but with this uh, beautiful uh, orchestra behind him. And so that song in particular, If I Can Dream, is on the album and it's just extraordinary. It's so beautiful. Wow. So thank you for bringing that up. That was very um, much a part of it. Yeah. There's, that's, 
is there there's a I read it something about a new movie a new film coming out in June 2022 yes. is that related to this uh this I'll tell you about it this is yeah. I'll tell you everything I know about it okay okay Boz Lerman is the right. director Boz Lerman is known for um Moulin Rouge and other big movies he's a he's a big director and has done a lot of good work I think he's Australian I'm not sure but anyway, he wanted to put together a biopic uh, of Elvis Presley. And um, I think he wants to cover a certain decades like the 50s, maybe early 60s, I'm not sure. But he went around looking for the right person to be Elvis. And Austin Butler is the name of the young man he has chosen. And I, I went online to, to find out about this guy and to hear what he sounds like. I saw an interview. Uh, Howard Fine is one of the most famous uh, acting teachers out in Hollywood. He's interviewed, uh, Austin Butler is interviewed by Howard Fine. You can look, you can find it on YouTube. And, and I'm sitting there watching, you know, on my phone, I'm watching this Austin Butler and I'm saying, I understand why he was chosen. There's a certain humbleness. I, I, he has that humble nature that Elvis had. Uh, he's very authentic and on top of everything else, he's been a musician since he was two years old, practically. He's been playing guitar forever. Oh. So, he had, so he had that, he had everything. And, and Baz Luhrmann is quoted as saying, I never thought I would get everything, you know, in one package, but this young man has it all. So yeah, it's supposed to open something like June 22nd or something. Um, and they don't year. even have a title. Yeah, this year, 2022. They don't have a title for it yet but it's, it's gonna happen, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, that should be really interesting. Oh. I sent him a book, by the way. I don't know that, I don't know if Boz Lerman got the book, but he didn't thank me for it, but I sent it to oh, him. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't see any other hands up. Um, Could I add a little story? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I went on another tour, it was a music tour uh, uh, in Memphis. And we got our group got to go in the studio where Elvis recorded most of his songs and using the same microphone he used, we recorded and they gave us a CD. So I, I even though my high school teacher asked me not to sing because I set people off, I'm part of a group record that CD that anybody gets in my car the first time they have to hear it. And supposedly it's with the same microphone and in the same recording studio that Elvis used most of the time. So it's great. great. You know, I, I would really recommend that people start to listen to Elvis. I'm not saying this just because I did this book. I, I never listened to Elvis. I never told you the story, but I, I didn't, I wasn't a fan. I, you know, I, I was into Bob Dylan and the Beatles and stuff. But when I was 13, I bought um, Heartbreak Hotel because he had sexy voice, you know, he goes, huh, 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 you know, all that. And I thought that was cool. <laughs> And that was the last of it. I never followed him after that. But since I did the book, I've been listening to him a lot. It's incredible. And you know, believe it or not, uh, I, I, I was interviewed by a local, the local newspaper and they said, um, uh, this reporter asked me at the very end of the interview, he says, so, so what's your, what was your favorite song of Elvis's? And you know, he had me on the spot and I thought, I just blurted out how great thou art. Now, I am a Jew and I love gospel and I love that song. It's a beautiful song. And um, if you haven't heard How Great Thou Art by Elvis Presley, I highly recommend it. And he, the, the reporter got such a kick out of it because he said, that's your favorite song and you're, you know, <laughs> you're Jewish. I said, yeah, you can be a Jew and love a lot of the gospel music that, that's out there. And um, so I hope you'll listen to How Great Thou Art, along with If I Can Dream. Oh, somebody's got their hand up. Myrna, yes. do you have your hand up? Yes, I want to say thank you. It was a wonderful program. I'm a big Elvis fan. I have all his record, Elvis tapes, and listen to it all the time. And that was magnificent. And I'm going to get your book. I look forward to reading it and putting with my thank Elvis you. tapes. <laughs> thank, thank you. And I'm sure that our library here in Cherry Hill has some Elvis in our CD collection and possibly even our vinyl collection, which we are building now. <laughs> so, 
Well, uh, if there's no other questions, I, I just want to thank you so much for uh, Roselle for coming and talking and and I learned so much um, so much good stuff that I knew I had a sense was in Elvis's heart. Um, and I want to thank all of you who attended and listened and asked questions. And uh, with that, I will I will close with saying uh, thank you all again, and I wish you a good evening. And thank you to all of you. And look me up when you come to the Berkshires. <laughs> Wonderful program. Thank you. Glad you liked it. <laughs> Good night, bye -bye. everybody. Thank Good you night, so Rizal. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>